This is a very short bill yeah. that is speaking only to four issues. Four, three, and five issues. Uh, the first issue, which I will ask, are the amendments to section 2021 20, and 22 of the criminal procedure, which uh, deal with the crimes against the state, uh, the imposition and the expansion of children uh, sabotage. And of course, the extension uh, of penalties to those that are allegedly unpatriotic. The second uh, issue pertains to the imposition of mandatory sentences for them. The third issue uh, pertains to the expansion of the definition of what are dangerous drugs. And the lastly, the amendments dealing with the issue uh, of abuse of office in an attempt to curtail the right definition uh, of abuse of office. Uh, Mr. Madam Speaker, ma'am, I want to dispose of uh, two, three, and four very quickly. We support, Madam Speaker, ma'am, the proposed amendments to section 138 of the court, which seeks to limit the wide expanse of section 138, the definition of abuse of office. And I want to support members who recognize that uh, civil servants exercise a lot of discretion. And oftentimes that discretion is exercised in good faith, uh, bona fide. Uh, but sometimes it turns out that uh, 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 the beneficiary of that discretion abuses that. It doesn't criminalize the officer. And the officer should not be frozen in a situation where he can't even be breathed because fear of breathing uh, makes it a criminal offense. I remember many years ago, uh, then Assistant Commissioner Chiburi was prosecuted for exercising a discretion uh, against the non prosecution of a certain. The matter went all the way uh, to the Supreme Court. And Justice McNally issued a judgment that says if a person holds power, he must exercise discretion. And not all discretion should be criminalized. Uh, so I, we support uh, that. Uh, I've seen prosecutors freezing, failing to exercise common sense for fear of abusing uh, their office and therefore prosecuted in terms of second So we support that. We also very quickly support the proposed amendments uh, to do with the drugs. Drugs, Madam Speaker, man, I evolved. Uh, when I grew up, the only drug that was an issue was prepared in the name commonly known as bad. Now you have got all kinds of things. There is heroin that is being smoked in this country. There is cocaine that is being smoked in this country. And I want to apologize to those who take it because some of these drugs are not smoked. They are taken in the Venus. There is Guga, there is Mitoriro, Vanara Stinka, when you speak about. So we need to deal with the scourge of drugs. We need to expand. If you go to court 14, when you speak about, there is a prosecutor, they call Tsokota. All he does is to prosecute people for crystal meth. It has got a complicated scientific name which I can't pronounce, otherwise, we're not serious. But the fact of the matter, when you speak about, is that we need to expand the definition, we need criminal penalties. My only problem with the current proposal is that we are only dealing with the small fish, the small fish that is selling or buying, but they are real dealers, Shmambinga, who take some drugs in the avenues and so forth. So we need, uh, Madam Speaker, ma'am, provisions that seek to deal with the supply lines of, of, of drugs. <coughs> Unless we can deal with, deal, with, deal with the supply line of drugs, we have a problem. Yeah, we have a problem. Uh, Madam Speaker, ma'am, the third issue is the issue of, of rap. So here we, we seek to impose mandatory, uh, severe mandatory penalties uh, for rape committed in aggravated circumstances. Madam Speaker, ma'am, rape is terrible. Rape is an invasion 
uh, of human rights, I would argue that rape is the ultimate uh, form of uh, invasion. Therefore, it deserves a harsh penalty. But if you say that, Madam Speaker, ma'am, we must trust the courts. We must trust the courts. Because right now, if you read newspapers, you have been imposing steady measures, 15 years, 14 years. We need to trust the courts, Madam Speaker, ma'am, by not imposing laws that, that restrict their hands. Uh, Madam Speaker, ma'am, Section 69. Uh, three of the constitution says if in a, a person is section 61 says a person is entitled to a fair trial a fair trial involves the examination of the question of criminal liability in the question of a of a descendant a court must be able to investigate the two issues one of liability was the mens rea is this person culpable and also the issue of the penalty a law must not tie the hands of the adjudicator, the judge, to simply look at conviction without also looking at the appropriate penalty. The judge or magistrate must also be allowed to look at the appropriate penalty. And if these judges are well trained, if these magistrates are well trained, surely they will understand that rape <coughs> is, is a vicious crime and we need to impose a vicious uh, uh, penalty. I have a problem personally with the mandatory penalties because they mistrust the judiciary. They tell the head of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the judiciary. Madam Speaker, now internationally, uh, mandatory penalties have been questioned as being unconstitutional because they tie the heads of uh, uh, the adjudicator. There is a case in Uganda called the case of uh, Alice Kibula. Uh, Alice Chibula, Chibula is spelled with a K. Uh, Alice uh, Chibula. Uh, in that case dealt with the imposition of uh, a mandatory sentence of uh, death when, uh, in, a, in a case of uh, penal uh, in, in capital punishment. In the Ugandan Constitutional Court, uh, Odoji CJ held that the imposition of a mandatory penalty is unconstitutional <coughs> because it ties the hands of the uh, adjudicator, the, the judge. The executive is interfering with the judicial independence. Judges must look at both the sentence and the penalty. So I would submit, Madam Speaker, that we should trust the judiciary. We should give them guidelines. They are already imposing. There's a judgment by Justice Yami where a rapist was given 30 years. So even that which we are talking about now, but only for sure. The, the Kikula case was actually followed in Malawi in the case of state versus which also held that uh, mandatory penalties are unconstitutional. So I submit, uh, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, ma through the Minister of Justice, that let us trust the courts. Let us not impose the mandatory penalties because they've got an unfair uh, issue of uh, uh, tying the heads of the judiciary. They have the judge already imposed 30 years, you are saying 15 years. Trust the judiciary. I now come to the uh, controversial issue. Let me speak about Zimbabwe is broken. Zimbabwe is polarized. We speak across each other. We speak tangential to each other. 44 years after independence, we have failed to craft a common vision. We have failed to craft a common ethos that unites us as a, as, a, as a people. We fail to answer the national question, what does it mean to be a Zimbabwe? We all have different answers. Honorable Molokele from Wange will have a different discourse on what it means to be, to be Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. Particularly if you come from a so-called minority, minority tribe, what does it mean to be a Numbi? What does it mean to be a Tonga? What does it mean to be a Shemwekanani in Zimbabwe? We have different narratives because the train of independence treated us differently. Madam Speaker, if you look at social media, if you look at the if you look at social media, the levels of toxicity, the levels of intolerance are huge. The, the levels of chasms are huge. We are as close to Rwanda in 1994 than we have ever been because of this 
huge chasm of intolerance, huge chasms of, uh, of uh, in, in, in difference. The Constitution says we are united in our diversity, but the challenge is that we have not been able to handle our differences well. We have weaponized our differences. And the consistent history of this country has been a history of failure, a history of failure of managing differences. The first Chimurenga of 1896 was a reflection of failure to manage differences between the white settler and those of us who were here and of our forefathers. The struggles that happened in the 40s, where the likes of Benjamin Burombo ended up in colonial prisons, was a byproduct of failure to manage differences. The Land Apportionment Act of 1931 and the imposition of apartheid state of Rhodesia was a reflection of the failure to manage our differences. Of failure to manage our differences. The, the cleanup operation, Operation Muramachina uh, of 2005 was yet again a failure of our, fa our inability to manage difference. The violence of 2008, in which thousands were, were displaced, in which men were killed in places like Chawana, in Mashona and Central, in places like Yetlands, again was a failure to manage our difference. We have spent the last 34 years, 44 years at each other's throat. Right now we are about to go into another election and every average Zimbabwe dreads an election because an election represents the highest expression of failure to manage our difference. When we fail to manage our difference, that is happening, Madam Speaker, Mama, because we have never been able to talk to each other. We have never been able to die. Honorable Ama Uswa quoted the chapter of Kenneth Kaunda's biography written in 1964. What Kenneth Kaunda wrote in 1964, Franz Fanon had written 10 years before in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, chapter 4, The Pitfalls of National Consciousness. And in The Pitfalls of National Consciousness, Franz Fanon speaks about the inability of what he calls the comprado bourgeois of accommodation and time. What this country, Madam Speaker, ma'am, needs is national healing. What this country needs, Madam Speaker, ma'am, is national reconciliation. What this country needs, Madam Speaker, ma'am, is dialogue. What this country needs, Madam Speaker, ma'am, is a new consensus. What this country needs, Madam Speaker, ma'am, is a recalibration of the national question. What is the national question? I'm Tonga, I come from Binga. What does it mean? Am I a Zimbabwe? If you go to certain parts of Zimbabwe, if you go to certain parts of Matibele and Madam Speaker, right now, 44 years after independence, the people are alienated, the people are being fight, they feel like they are fourth-class citizens of this country because independence came like a whirlwind and left them. So what we need, Madam Speaker, are things that bring us together, not things that divide us apart. This particular provision divides us apart. After all, it's totally unnecessary and it's fictitious. It's totally unnecessary because everything it seeks to do is already criminalized. If you go outside and call for a war or sabotage against your country, the law already provides that in section 2021 20, and 2022. Treason is, is, is a, a crime in Zimbabwe. Sabotage is a crime in Zimbabwe. So the only thing new that is sought to be criminalized uh, is what is to be, to be perceived to be, to be words of mouth. You sit in a meeting, but there is no individual, Madam Speaker, ma there is no individual who is more powerful than the government. There is no individual who can successfully call for sanctions. It's not possible. It is not possible. It's a myth. It's fiction. It doesn't happen. Governments are independent. They function on their own. So this provision is totally unnecessary. This provision is divisive. My good friend and brother, the Minister of Ziyami, has just come from Cairo, where there was a round table conference on Zimbabwe's debt. A lot of progress has been made, but this kind of provision <coughs> does that progress. 
the kind of provisions that we incorporated in the Private Voluntary Organization Amendment Act and does that progress. Because they paint us as portrayers as an extractive country, as a vicious country, as an intolerant country. For these and other stories, visit our website www.263chat.com. Follow us on Twitter at 263chat and like our Facebook page 263chat.